Hello, everyone. I'm doing a PCAP analysis um, network traffic workshop here at Hacticon this year. Um, it's going to be in two parts. The first part we'll do with some slides, and the second part we'll actually get some uh, hands-on um, work. And um, we do have a lot to go through. I'm not quite sure we'll get it all done. I was planning to set up an environment and do um, analysis of actual exploits and stuff like that, but unfortunately, I have not had enough time. However, we do have PCAPs, or malicious PCAPs, so at the end, we can also um, spend some time, if you have enough, to play with them. You guys can dig and see what you can find. So um, I am a Unix administrator. I also do some PCI compliance, minor defense stuff. I have a, an interest in Linux and open source, free and open source software. Uh, so I, I run the Dubois County Linux user group, and I also have another project. I work with a bunch of guys where we play around with security tools and write articles and such called the Southern Indiana Computer Club. Um, we are, this is our website here. I'm going to give a plug here because a lot of the stuff I've been working on, I've written articles on. So there's a lot of really technical articles on various aspects of packet capture, and especially on the NetSniff NG suite, which I'm one of the few that have material out now for that. And um, it's a brand new suite of tools, high performance packet capture tools, which we'll talk about um, momentarily. Okay, so a little theory. So this is a diagram of how packets come into a NIC and make it to the host operating system's memory. And basically, down toward the bottom where it shows the blue boxes that say frame, a packet will reach the NIC over the Ethernet cable, right? It will be copied in a FIFO buffer, first in, first out, queue on the network card. It's actually internal physical RAM on the NIC. From there, a buffer descriptor is then passed to the host operating system describing that packet. That packet then gets transferred to the host machine's me system memory. And then if you're using Linux or FreeBSD, it makes its way into the kernel and all that. So it's basically being physically addressed in the host operating system. And that's one thing we need to, to know. Okay, so in the Linux kernel, there's, there has been historically two ways. Um, the one on the left, the receiver old API at the top, that is the old one. I think that's two dot, the 2.4 kernels and below. They had a, a um, mechanism where after the, net, or the packet hits the network card, an IRQ, a hardware interrupt is generated. The packet then makes its way after the, either using DMA, direct memory access to copy to the host operating system's memory, or it uses the C CPU intervention if you're using older systems. Um, the packet eventually makes its way up to the backlog queue at the, in the red at the top. And then it pass, gets passed to the IP stack where you see the IP receive function and then you know, makes its way up to UDP, TCP, or what have you until it eventually reaches the socket that the application is listening. And on the right side, we have the new application programming interface, which uses a polling mechanism. So all, pretty much every kernel you're running nowadays is using this new application programming interface, this new way of getting packets from the NIC into the kernel. And the advantages of this are there's built-in interrupt mitigation, because the problem with the old mechanisms, you have to generate an IRQ every time a NIC, our packet hits the NIC, and then if you have a large packet per second rate, you'll actually, the, the CPU will not be able to respond to the actual applications listening because there'll be an interrupt storm which takes up all the time processing the packets and it can't keep up with any of the applications that are listening for the packets. And a way to do this is to fill the ring and every couple microseconds, we actually have the CPU pull the, the, the buffer that actually contains the packet. So then you have extra microseconds that are used for actual processing of your normal um, operating system data. Here is a diagram of uh, the packet path the ingress direction of packets coming into the NIC. So we see at the bottom, a interrupt is the very bottom, which says network card hardware. To the left, we see an interrupt is generated. Then on modern systems, it used direct memory access, to the ring, ring buffer into the operating system. And then over to the right in the dotted line, you'll see the NAPI. If the, app, if, excuse me, if the uh, new application program interface is on your system, you're using that, then you'll pass the, the backlog queue toward the top, where it says in queue backlog which if you guys ever did um, operating system tuning, um, when you use syscontrol, uh, net, um, dev, max, 
backlog or something similar to that, and you increase the value, they say you can, you can hold more packets and, and reduce your, your number of losses uh, for a packet capture. Well, if you're using the new application program interface, you're actually not, you're bypassing that in queue backlog, and that really doesn't help. However, if you do use receive packet steering, it's a newer technology, I'm not completely familiar with it, but the idea is that you can distribute pa more packets and have them backlogged onto multiple interfaces if you're using symmetric multiprocessing. You have uh, multiple cores on your CPU, you can have them queue up on different ones so it disperses or distributes the packets across multiple cores, which can aid in performance. Okay, so in Linux, um, you're actually, whenever you use NetStat to get um, network information uh, statistics, you're actually reading from ProcNetDev. And you can use, um, there's another tool called ETHTool, which actually uh, asks for a lo more lower level information, such as drops from your network card buffers, like the uh, first in, first out, we talked about that FIFO buffer. So you can use ETHTool-S, for instance, and then the name of the network card, if your card's supported, obviously, because the ETHTool only works on certain cards, which is quite a few of the common ones. You know, request, it, um, request information directly from the driver. And we'll get into all that. I'll have, um, in, the, in the materials, we'll go through it so you can see how that works and actually query it. Um, let's see here. I'll skip this one. So here, one thing to notice, um, like I, s I mentioned about ETHTool, is if, if you use ETHTool, you can grep for a parameter uh, RX mist or no buffer at the top I have. And this is a, a um, clip from the Linux kernel mailing list where a guy asked about Basically, what are, these, what are these parameters? What are the values hold? What does that mean? And if you, the Rx mix, um, or excuse me, Rx missed errors, if you can look up there, it says it, it indicates that the frames were dropped due to the adapters FIFO getting full and overflowing. So if you have those numbers there, there's values greater than zero, that means you lost some data. You lost some packets coming into your dick. Now below, there's another number, Rx no buffer count. That basically indicates that the driver, it tried to request buffers but the actual bus on your machine was unable to allocate those buffers for the packets. So it'll try and try and try, and eventually, if it, if it, if it cannot get those, pack, or those buffers requested to fill the packets in because there's too many coming in at once, then you'll have an RX missed. And these are, this is lower level um, drops from the, on the network card driver. Um, here's a tool called IFPPS. It's from the NetSniff NG project. Um, here, uh, it basically pulls the kernel, and it's different from tools like TCP stat, which use libpcap, it makes calls to libpcap to pull information um, on how many packets, the packet rate and, and the, uh, the bytes and all that, but here we're actually pulling the kernel directly, so the, the, statistics, statistics, excuse me, the statistics will be slightly more accurate. And we'll get into all that. Here's, here's some stuff from my, um, some articles I've written, I got some uh, screenshots where you can take IFPPS and write data into CSV files, or you can print it to the screen. Here we just use some um, command line kung fu, use awk, and we're able to grep, or excuse me, grab fields that we want and print them to the screen. And here, um, an example, here's this, this gawk statement I wrote that prints out the, takes the Unix timestamp and transfers it to um, your local time or the time that you specify. And then we use um, some other gawk um, print statements to grab the fields that we want, and this is the way we can determine where, what second in our machine um, had the high, high amounts of interrupts. And we see that down there in the CPRX columns, um, or any of those, really, that we have, see we have one that's at 20,000 um, hardware interrupts per second, and so on. Now here I did the same thing, except I made an OR statement, basically grabbing um, two fields, and what the RX drops and the RX errors, and if they are greater than zero, that means we've got those errors. So we'll look for every timestamp I have in my files of that dump of IFP, IFPPS data and grab and look for where we, we had an error at a particular time or a drop in frames. And we'll get into all that again. I'll, we'll have hands-on material for that. So um, go to the next one. Uh, the most ubiquitous um, BPF compiler is uh, with the libpcap suite. Now the NetSniffNG project is working on their own. It's actually, it's pretty well done. It's a low level compiler though. It's called BPFC. And I know Emmanuel, or excuse me, Daniel is working on a high level um, language for that right now. So 
so that you can use simple BPF buffers like ARP and to de our des destination port, you know, 23, whatever. But um, for now, you have to use um, assembly like mnemonic. And here's an example of some BPF filters. So BPF is the Berkeley pa Packet Filter Expression Language. And this is basically where we parse um, data coming into our machine and look for specific fields like, you know, we're a host, of, um, we want to say capture all traffic from a particular host or a particular network and destined to a particular machine with a specific port so we can watch connections um, come and go. And these are a bunch of different um, ones. We got basic filters on the left, advanced on the right. We'll get into these. Um, here is actually the mnemonic version at the top. In the, in the picture below is the opcode version of BPF filters. And we'll just go through one of these. I have a, these in my other talks explained um, thoroughly. But um, like here we first load, uh, look at this instruction 000. We load the half word of the frame into the accumulator. And it's the 12th byte. And if you look down at the bottom of the Ethernet header, that's the Ethernet type field. And the next instruction, 001, is adjust equal. So if that value is equal, if you can, I should have turned my syntax off in BIM, but um, it says 0x, or excuse me, 0x806, uh, and that basically says that the ARP um, bits are set in that frame. And then if that's set, then return the full packet, and we have the value of 65,535. And then below it, if you if that false, then jump to a zero or that instruction three and return nothing. We basically got more technical ones. We don't need to go through those. Um, let's see here. Here is an example of a advanced BPF filter, and I use grep here just so you could see the red. You could use color uh, code or uh, syntax so you could see what I was talking about. But here we're actually grab, uh, grabbing for um, SYN and SYNAC packets from the TCP segments. They have those two bits set, and you know those are common in every in initiated connection you make with TCP that you'll send a SYN, a SYN act will come back, and, they'll, and then they'll complete it with the final act. So this is just a, a simple way to see how you can, you can drill down specific bits. Um, here, we use, I use a ping with a record route option. It's an, it's a, I don't know if you guys know what that is. A, it's an old IP version four option. That you can sp that's basically a predated trace route style um, where you can record the paths. And we, I send a record route out, and you, can only, you only have so many bytes, I believe it's nine, um, that you can fit, so you can only fit nine IP addresses in the, in the resulting frame because of the max size. And we basically split the byte and um, mass the zero bits, and then a 15, if it's greater than five, then we'll return those, looking for those specific packets. But, this, you don't really need to know all this. Is, this is really technical, and you have to drill down on it. But just to get an idea of how granular you can be in picking out and specifying your data is what's important, the concept to get that. So another one is uh, we actually captured a git method, so HTTP git request. And we basically look for the hex values of get and then the space or the new line. But this, in this case, would be the space. Um, at the, t at the where the TCP header starts, where it says 32, so we get 32 bytes over, we start from there and count the next four bytes, which would be those, those four characters, G, E, T, and then the space. And if those match, then we can dump that. But you, there's more, there's tools that are much better for this, like ngrep, where you can actually grab ASCII strings, ASCII characters, and, and the such. Um, so here's uh, the NetSniff NG, NG uh, toolkit I was talking about. And it's a high performance, um, well, at least the NetSniff NG portion of the toolkit is, is one of my favorites. Um, a high performance packet sniffer. It is, doesn't use libpcap, it uses libc. So it actually takes advantage, the first sniffer that actually takes advantage of the, the PF packet socket structure in the kernel that, you, that uses the, the newer additions of the RX and TX rings. So you get better packet performance over at TCP dump or, or daemon logger. And there's also a few other tools like the traffic generator, TrafGen. Um, a guy, this is a newer one, Mazan. Um, actually, I'm not really sure how you pronounce that, Mazan. Um, this is brand new. The guy um, that wrote this, originally authored it, died last year, and we, they've taken that up. So they're going to get it to become a basically, I'm, I'm assuming, a uh, kind of replacement for HPing, but much, much greater uh, speeds and performance on, on sending packets. Um, 
You got the BPFC packet filter and then IFPPS, which I talked about briefly. The rest we won't go into. Um, so I'm actually now a minor contributor to the NetSniff NG project. I'm doing a little documentation on it, writing this, I work on new man pages, and um, I'm gonna write new code for IFPPS here soon to be able to pull multiple interfaces at once. And I have a few other ideas, maybe querying the ETH tool um, information I talked about earlier. So you can pull those RX miss, no buffer count information in there. Um, so you know, expect maybe some new things from me in the future. Um, here's a quick look at NetSniffNG. Uh, by default, it produces a lot of information. One packet will fill your screen. Um, but you can narrow down easily. I usually don't use NetSniffNG. Net if, if you're doing an analysis, I recommend writing packets to disk with NetSysNG, NetSniffNG, and in the background or, or um, later on when you need to actually analyze them, use TCP dump or something that has a high level uh, BPF expression language. So it's much easier to narrow down because you don't really want to mess with the, the filters I'm going to show you here in a moment. Here's, uh, it's really easy to use. Um, the only two really op the options you really need to know is in and out. So dash dash in, you can specify a PCAP file, an interface, any, any sort of those uh, common things, and then you specify out. You can specify another PCAP file if you want to write a PCAP to a PCAP and put a filter on it. You can specify in from ETH0, out from ETH1, so you can copy packets from one interface out the other. It's got a lot of functionality, um, but not as granular as TCP replay. And uh, I basically use it in my, in my in production environment to write um, packets to disk, and then later I can revert back if I need to, if we detect a, a breach or something like that, or there's some suspicious traffic that I need to know about. Because th this is the only thing I can really get to keep up with it if I'm not using PF ring, which is now in the security engine distro. Um, so here's an example of writing a BPF filter. So we basically have that same uh, mnemonic assembly-like um, language, and you would just actually put that text in a, in a file and pass it to BPFC, and then it would write uh, another file that takes the opcodes, and then you take NetSniffNG and you pass the dash F filter option, and it'll read that file, and then you can add that filter, and the filter's put in the kernel, so. Um, you can also do the same thing with TCP, and we'll get into all that, though. Let's see here. So let me ask you a quick question. Is, ever, is everybody, got, ha, do, does everybody have the material they need now? Do we have anybody that wants a copy of the material? Okay, cool. So we'll get started in just a second. So here I'm using uh, NetSniffNG, and it actually outputs uh, for every time interval, you can set, hey, I want to record for every 60 seconds, generate a new PCAP, or every hour, or every day, and I do daily PCAPs, so I just specify it's in seconds, so 86,400 seconds. And every time you write a new one, that little rectangle I put up there, um, it specifies how many packets were received and dropped, and I wrote some aux scripts to go through there, and um, find out times where I drop packets, which is definitely needed to know. And here, back to traffic gen, um, there's a Linux kernel packet um, generator called PKT gen. It's the fastest one out there right now that I'm aware of. Um, but uh, if you look at this graph, um, traffic gen is slowly, or it's pretty much, it's, it's getting up there. Not quite as fast, but I know they're gonna do a lot of performance um, techniques and uh, mechanisms where they're, they're, their goal is to get it as fast as PKT gen. So, that's something to look at as well. If you need to replay network traffic or test um, IDS devices or firewalls, you just, just hammer it. Okay. Here's a number of tools um, that we will touch on a little bit. Like here's NTOP, it gives you graphical representation of um, PCAP data, it'll plot it using RRD tool. IFTOP is a good way, it's a session uh, connection management tool where you can, it takes, um, looks for streams, just um, the coordinates, uh, an IPS source destination, source and destination, and it will show you on a graph, and it will apply, uh, apply a linear logarithmic style um, bars across the screen, left to right, you can see, like the guy at the very top has, is generating the most traffic at that period of time. You can apply filters. Here we can do um, the TCP flow, which we'll touch on. Uh, you can uh, reassemble data from a TCP connection. Same with TCP PIC. Speedometer, another graphical tool. And network rep, where you can, here's a, a, a very ugly um, 
very ugly uh, way to grab the data I needed. Um, just kept adding more regular expressions on it. Um, okay, so if everybody's got what they need, we can. Everybody see that? Okay, so. All right, so in the, we're first going to go through the uh, open up the PCAP worksheet, this file. And you can just open it in VI or any text editor if you'd like. And I got it. It's, it's quite long. I don't think we'll get through all this today. But um, let's see where it says. Okay, so first we'll start off with just basic um, things like ifconfig and netstat. So let's, I'll open a new terminal window here. Oops. Keyboard small. Okay, so if you're on a Linux machine and use ifconfig, well, you can do it on a BSD or OS 10, and we'll specify the interface. If you're on OS 10, you would use EN0 probably. It's probably your first interface. And here we actually get some data about our the, the first network card on the bus. And this things to to pay attention to are the amount of packets we can receive, the errors, the drop number. You can see this is not really. I don't have an Ethernet connection at the moment, so we don't have anything flowing through here. We need to pay attention to these, and then the total RX bytes and trans, uh, transmitting bytes, the TX values. So if you wanted to list all your network cards, you can do dash A, everything that's detected on the bus. And here we have my Wi-Fi card at the very bottom, WLAN 0. You can see we, got, uh, we had a very small amount of packets that were received and, and sent. Okay, so. So that's where you first, that's where you get your first stats from, those Rx values. You want to know the values that dropped on ifconfig, ifconfig if you're um, like doing IDS and stuff like that, or packet capturing all day long, if you have a dedicated box, you need to know how much you're missing. Because the goal is to not lose any data that may be valuable in the future. So those values in ifconfig are actually read and, and uh, net stat. If we do a... Um, I. Here we go. Here's some more. Here's basically the same values. So these are read from ProcNet Dev, which is a, pro, a, a virtual file system in the Linux kernel. And if we can type that to columns.t. Made, made it a little better. But here you can get those values too if you just want to see all at once. You don't want to go through the, just the normal list every interface that I have configured. It's a little more concise. Or we can do cat proc net dev. Get the values here. That's really ugly. Let's do column again. T. Well, my, my, my terminal is so small right now, it's not going to display well. But if you have a larger terminal, it will put them in columns. It'll be easy to read. So the important point to know is that these, these values are read from the, the kernel file procnet dev. So you basically just pull that file. Like if you're in C, you'd write like an open, F open in the file or something. And then you'd pull it for a certain amount of time. Then you'd subtract the value from that second to the, the prior one. And then it shows you how many. Um, with, with the values for that period of time. So you just read that. You can also watch it. You use the watch tool. Watch every second. Cat proc net. And this, you can see at the top, the seconds, these are actually just catting it over and over and over. However, there's nothing coming in, unfortunately, so you won't see values change. And here, if you want to, you can use quick oct, oct script here. Um, we're going to print the first column of that data, which is the interface, a, interface name. And then we're going to print the fifth column, which is the drop count. And obviously, since we, I have no packet rate coming in, I'm not dropping anything. So it's a quick way to, to do um, using command line tools to get what you want. Another thing that we talked about is interrupt. So if we use VM stat dash M1, we'll just display data in, in megabytes and every, print every second. Um, we talked about uh, high interrupt usage. Well, if you want to see what it looks like when interrupts go really high, we can use, if you print anything to a terminal, 
your terminal's, there's going to be an, an interrupt triggered so the CPU can write data to the terminal. And if you use a program called yes, which just prints Y's to the screen, over and over and over, should see our interrupt way, uh, rate go way up here. 610 now. Usually it's in the thousands. Hold on here. Context switch rate, if you notice that, that's every time an interrupt generated, you gotta switch from user space to kernel space. We can see that we're in the thousands right there, really high numbers. I'll point that out right here. And that's due to this yes command. So that's another way. These are, these are just admin tools that you'll need to know and um, just for you know, anything in particular, any normal administration work, these are, these are valuable. And now we'll use IFPPS. You may not have this installed if you did not compile um, the NetSniffNG toolkit, which I recommend compiling it. The, the, the package in, the, in uh, the Debian repositories is very old. You will not get any of the new features, and you trust me, you can't, you can't even um, write to a PCAP, if I remember correctly. So here, here's, um, let's do my wireless interface. So they don't have anything coming in, but um, terminal small as well, so it's a little um, mixed up here and jumbled. But if you do wireless, you can also get uh, line noise and signal and all that, so that's useful too. And this basically just reads proc net dev in the background. It also reads proc net interrupts. Oops, I apologize. That's not proc net. It's proc which is basically is all your interrupt information, what devices are assigned to which interrupt and which CPUs. So CPU zero and, and CPU one. And here you can also see the amount of interrupts uh, accumulated over time by cutting this if you don't want to use VMstat or another tool. And there's also, it reads values from uh, soft, software interrupt, which is another form of interrupt that's higher level. <laughs> You read those values too. Okay, so let's get down to ETH tool. Okay, so let's just grab information. So this gives us link information about our car. This is low level information. This is a very, very useful tool to, to have in your tool belt. If you know all the ins and outs of it, you can really debunk or um, fix a lot of problems. So here we're gonna use ETH tool dash S, Oops, guys. this may be my card, um, let's try Linux zero. Yeah, okay, so that, that doesn't work on my card, the drivers for this card. But if you do dash S, it will give you a large list of values, um, which is quite a bit, you'll have to uh, use uh, command line filtering to get what you want probably, but you can get those RX miss values and those no buffer count values. And on some cards, there'll actually be a draw, an RX drop count, but I know on the e E1000 driver for the NICs I use at work, um, that, that is not present. Those cards don't use that, don't read anything from it, because the, the NICs aren't built to write information about drop counts like that. They have to use, they use the RX buffer count and the um, RX missed. Okay, a few other things. Um, so we, we showed how, these are in the slides too, and we can use egrep and grab the RX missed values, no buffer. Um, we can actually increase the amount of FIFO buffer descriptors, the number of packets we can address in the first in, first out buffer queue on the physical NIC by using the G. Oops, I said that again, that's not good. Okay. And I'm not supported again, so I guess these, none of these will work at the moment. Um, but if you, if you use dash G, you can query it. And then if you use capital dash G, you can actually set it. So I would specify ETH zero. I want to increase my buffer count to 4096, which is the max on the E1000 cards that use that driver. And I, and I increase the max of the, TA, the transmit values to 4096. The default, I think off the top of my head, is 256. So that's quite a bit of difference. And you can notice, um, if your CPU can catch up, you can notice uh, that your machine or your car will be able to handle more packets. You'll have less drops, potentially, at that layer. Uh, another thing is um, this dash K, we use these to view. 
Let me see this column up here, show. These are all show commands, the show information. These are, and then the uh, uppercase is the set. So these ones right here. The dash K will actually show offloading features in the card so that the, maybe the NIC can do the checksum, calculate the checksum values, or it can actually bundle packets up and make them bigger so that they, they can just pass one large packet to um, the kernel such that when it's come to uh, receive um, offloading and segmentation offloading. And here, here's a um, generic receive offloading on, have it turned on in this instance. Uh, generic segmentation offloading turn on, Rx check something turn on. Um, you have to play around with these. You're having lots of, um, if, you're, if your card is slow, you may turn all these off. It may rely on the CPU to actually do more of the processing. And I've had that happen, especially in one of my boxes, where I would lose a lot of packets in the NIC, and I actually, these were all set on, I turned them off and I got much better performance. I still had some losses, but significantly improved on how much, um, on the amount of data that I could now handle, or that NIC card could now handle, by actually allowing the CPU to take over some of the work. So I would just turn all these off, on, switch to off, and the RX values off, so then the CPU would actually do the, when it, when it, when it went up the stack, would do the actual RX uh, checksumming um, function. Here's another thing that's really important, uh, especially if you're a passive device, is this dash A. This is for pause frames, so Ethernet, um, in the specification, there it's a, it's a flow, tro flow control mechanism where um, a frame is sent, and if, if a machine is getting bombarded with packets that cannot keep up, it can send a pause frame to the receiving device or the switch. Some switches take advantage of it, and they'll say, oh, well, let me, let me queue some of the packets in the actual switch and let this guy catch up, and then we'll send the rest there. So if you turn off pause frames, and it's a you know, receive only um, network card, um, where you, you, know, you don't have an assigned to an IP address, then you'll be able to handle more data. But you could also have more losses, but you may encounter even more greater losses if, every, if all the other machines on your network are buffering that, that, that data. Okay, so uh, another thing is interrupt coalescence. This is basically setting inter interrupt mitigation techniques on the driver. And here, basically, we, we want to pull every, on the receive, every 100 microseconds here. You can set the values, um, or excuse me, view the values. I think mine, on one of my machines, um, with using the etool-c, the network card name, I think the default was three microseconds. So here you can increase it if you want to, or you can um, lower the value. Basically, all this, there's no guarantees on what is going to improve the performance of your system in regards to packet capture. You basically need to check all these things, test, um, turn them on, turn them off, and while you're doing all that, flood it with, with network traffic, and then use tools like MPSTAT and VMSTAT and all those, and watch performance statistics. And then whenever you're using sniffing tools, watch the drop rates. And you can kind of gauge how, how much or how little each uh, additional increase in these settings um, will have upon the system. So here's more OS um, configurables. Sorry, um, we got ProcNet soft stats. Okay, so when we talked earlier about that backlog queue, when we looked at that graph, if the new NAPI systems don't use the backlog queue, then it, there's a, a, a drop stats for um, machines that use the older API, and these values can be read from ProcNet soft NAT stat. And it's the second column, if I do recall, the, of the drops values. We're not using that right now, and of course I don't have any flood of packets coming in. So you would just, you could just print the second column, I suppose. And each, each row is a CPU. So I have two cores, so therefore I have two columns, two rows. Um, so we can just print the second one. So we get those zeros right there. And you could um, just grab Let's go back real quick, I'll show you. Um, and he, over here, I have an example where those are in hex, you know, hex, eh. You can convert them to decimal and get the actual values, or human readable values anyway, or easier. Um, so we use the printf and we give it a character format code of decimal and we print the value out there. So we can just like grab this right here. Printf. Oh, that would be my zero X. Sorry. 
So I was really hard typing like this. So I got two, uh, six, or 2,672. Those are the receive packets, this receive field. Then we can do a new line character, and then it'll print on it. Because over here, it actually printed on the same line, because we didn't tell the, the terminal to print on a new line. So we just add the slash, backslash in. So I may, I, I'm, something I would like to do is add this in ETH tool to have maybe use, um, if the machine has, or excuse me, IFPPS, if the machine has ETH tool on board, call that, have it query the, the network card and see if it's using Nappy or not, and then maybe print those values in case they're of use to anybody. So I, I'd read uh, proc, uh, soft stats, uh, net soft, soft net stats, and then print those values out. That's something on my to-do list. Okay, so another thing is most modern kernels, sorry, have um, the just-in-time compiler in it which is a BPF compiler in the kernel, just, just, just in time, uh, just in time comp compilation, uh, speeds up the process of applying BPF filters to packets. And NetSniffNG, when you run that automatically, does operating system performance tuning. And one of the things it turns on is this, and you can just uh, turn, it off, turn it on yourself by echoing a value of one into that proc file. And uh, I know a lot of machines I've encountered, I don't think that's on by default, so you would want to turn that on. You can maybe be able to get take advantage of um, having that on with, with some machines that will use the just-in-time compiler, such as libpcap uh, style programs. Are you guys ready for lunch? Some of you? Want to take a break? For those that want to go to lunch, um, you guys can, and then I'll stay in here with some people that want to do labs and continue and ask questions. Because it's about lunchtime. All right? Well, I'll keep on rolling. All right. So here's some other values. We talked about that. Uh, that uh, See here the backlog, and here's here's the uh, sys control value for it. We can actually I'm just going to copy and paste this. If you're on Linux, you can do Shift Insert to actually paste it. And here it's actually set as a thousand. So if you're on an older Nappy system, you could uh, increase the value by specifying a uh, their option to write it. So dash W. And I want to get, I want to make it a hundred thousand, say. And now it's a hundred thousand. So we can query it again. We can see that the value has changed. So we can store that many more packets in the backlog queue. We also have another, uh, a few other values that I'm going to skip over. These are memory values for sockets and the like. If you want to echo, if you want to use um, the backlog and have it set up on boot, you can actually echo that syscontrol value into your. Um, syscontrol.comp file so that which is read after all the init scripts are done and it'll set those values on boot. Okay, another thing is um, as far as device configuration for drivers, you can do, I don't know if I have one on my system at the moment. Well, anyway, this is a, I created a file in Etsy modprob.probe.d, and basically just, you can specify driver op options, specific ones. And here, this is just a kernel file. You would use this in any, if you had to configure any driver module in the machine, and when it boots up, it would read this, the modpro command would read this file and set the settings in the kernel and then load the module. Here, I, I set, um, you can turn off checksumming in the driver, before we use ETH tool to do that, but you can actually specify in a configuration file. You can set the values of the RX and uh, TX descriptors like we talked about. Like before we set, um, we talked about how they were 256 by default. You can increase them with ETH tool. 
Um, here I did the same with uh, an RX descriptors option in the cur with the, the driver itself. You can do flow control. This would be the pause frames right here. A zero means turn them off. One means turn them on. Um, interrupt throttle rate. This is a the rate uh, when the interrupts reach this 5,000 interrupts per second. Start the throttle. I debugging mode on, but I haven't actually seen it print anything. I'm not sure if it does anything. Um, and here is if you use mod uh, info on a specific module. And I'll do questions here in just a second because we're, we're almost done with the first half or so. Mod info dash p, which is the parameters, and we do the name of the driver. Let's see, hold on. Oh, mod info. I'm sorry. So basically, this is the information I, I copied and pasted down there. If you see it toward the uh, right here, all this stuff. This basically gives you the options that you can set whenever you set the, when you uh, insert the driver into the kernel, and that basically was that file I was using. So you can just get an idea. Some of this stuff may not make sense to you. I, it didn't make sense to me, so what I'd have to go back to the actual um, driver documentation on the internet, and then I would have to read what it means, and um, then set the values in my .conf file. So that's mod info dash p, and you guys have all these notes. You have everything on um, in that in that uh, tar archive I gave you. Okay, and we'll get, when we come back, we'll start with this, the actual traffic analysis stuff. Does anybody have any questions? I cover a lot of stuff. I probably didn't explain it the best because I'm trying to fly through this. There's literally so much. Um, do I need to be more clear on anything? Doing good? Not, not too bad? Am I boring? All right, cool. All right, well, then I'm going to go to lunch myself. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.